This is uh, not really science. This is uh, authority work. And my main question is, how could we achieve the safety of the food con contact materials, which is basically promised to the consumers by legislation? Legislation says it is safe. We, as an authority, should make sure that this safety is really um, put into practice. <coughs> I start with a um, small deviation. Um, organic food is very successful, at least in Switzerland, I think uh, everywhere. There is obviously a broad demand for it, and um, there are certainly many reasons for that. But one reason which I think should be important for us is the mistrust in safety. Many consumers don't trust the valuation of the authorities for various reasons, but um, the non-linear uh, relationship um, mentioned this morning could be one. Uh, they would probably rather call it a homeopathic activity. Um, no evaluation, official evaluation, takes such a thing in, into account. We always evaluate by a linear assumption. Okay, there is a mistrust, and in case of the pesticides, that's the um, organic. Um, we have to say this is probably the best toxicological evaluation we have got in the food sector. Um, also there is a large amount of control done by the, throughout the chain and uh, by authorities, so it's the best controlled part probably. Nonetheless, um, many uh, consumers don't believe in it. Um, if I tried to get some numbers the, for the estimated exposure, very roughly. What usually is detected is um, 5 to perhaps 50 ppb of a substance, of a pesticide in the food. Can be more, but this is just a, the most common range. And from that, maybe the exposure is in the order of 10 micrograms per day. And this is for the sum of all pesticides together which may be a nonsense, but just gives a uh, dimension. So 10 micrograms per day. Now if I go over to the food contact material, things look much worse. First of all, we know that the overall migration, gravimetrically determined, is commonly in the range of 5 to 30 milligrams per kilogram. And if I <coughs> do such a rough um, estimate as before, then exposure is in the order of several milligrams per day. This is um, not all relevant, physiologically relevant, but perhaps half of that would be. So it remains in the range of milligrams per day. And this is then 100 to 1,000 times more than the exposure to the pesticides. So if people don't want to eat chemistry and by organic materials, um, it is certainly not with the pesticides they should start. It's a complicated field also because I'd, I don't really know. I would guess that about 100,000 substances of a molecular mass below 1,000 Dalton um, exceeds the threshold of toxicological concern for unknown substances, which means they can be carcinogenics. Um, <coughs> Of these, well, that's a very rough estimate, of these, um, not even 2,000 are properly evaluated, some of which have been evaluated long, long ago. Um, okay, so it's a very small uh, part of it. The majority of all these substances has not even a name. They have not been identified. Um, yeah. So if I go back to the pesticides for comparison, this is a lot more, perhaps 100 times more, substances. Um, the resources spent into it, however, are just the opposite. Much more is done for pesticides than for food packaging. Now you could say um, food contact materials are not sites, pesticides or insecticides. So they're not meant to be toxic. Sure not. Um, and it's, of course, not really possible to, to compare pesticides with migrating substances. However, 
Um, chemistry doesn't distinguish that well. There is no green and red molecule. So, um, <coughs> yeah, the, dif the difference is smaller. And sure enough, uh, in the migrating substance, uh, substances, there are al also those which would not even be accepted as pesticides because they are too toxic. So <coughs> it remains that um, the food contact material is a big um, gap in food safety. And uh, this is my question. Why should consumers trust in the safety of food contact materials if they don't trust in pesticides, or why should they trust more? Perhaps because it is more not so easy to do without packaging material. I want to show a little bit a picture of the situation um, in terms of chromatography. My mind is chromatographically um, shaped, so for me peaks are pictures, and um, I don't know whether you can understand those. It's very difficult to create a picture of what is the reality. Because if I talk to people, they say, well, that's all safe. Others say, well, how do you show? OK, chromatography. Um, this is a very simple case. This is a, a polypropylene just from the main manufacturer. Um, it is not made to a film, it's not glued, it's no, there is no adhesive, no print, nothing. So it's just a crude polypropylene with a bit of an um, ircophos as an um, antioxidant in it. This granulate was extracted <coughs> with solvent. It was pre-separated by liquid chromatography into six fractions. And then what you see here are GC chromatograms, gas chromatograms. And um, every signal going up is a substance. The higher it is, the larger is the amount. So I think this is the logic. OK, if you go the classical way, polypropylene, you go into the list and you see for this, <coughs> there are two substances which, have, which are listed. This is propylene. OK, where is the propylene? Propylene is not here. It's anyway evaporated. Oh, easy job. Secondly, we have uh, an additive. This is the ircophos, and this forms this peak. OK, finished. That's the common picture. However, if you look at it chromatographically, you see that there are many, many more peaks. Each peak is a substance. Um, the next question is, of course, um, what is relevant? Um, is each of these peak of some relevance. Then you have to do some calculations, and I start again from the threshold of toxicological concern, which is <coughs> 0.15 microgram per day. It's an exposure, it's not a concentration. If I just make it simple, assume 150 grams of food per day packed in such a material. Um, if I assume that the thin film might be more or less completely extracted into the food, then um, this threshold corresponds to about 0.1 milligram per kilogram plastic, and this is about the peak here. Which means that every peak which is beyond this size is potentially relevant. And for us, as enforcement, we have to make sure that the producer ensures the safety of each of these. OK, some are very trivial. These are fatty acids. Nobody will say this is toxic. For many more, this could also be shown quite easily. But the matter is to exclude that there is a, a really toxic component in it. Again, this is just um, a granulate, a crude polypropylene. Nothing done it. As soon as you print it and so on, the chromatogram becomes more rich than this. <coughs> That's an old chromatogram. This is now HPLC with fluorescence as a um, detection system, which, only see the, which can only detect bisphenolic components, not bisphenol A necessarily, any component having that basic structure. Um, you see lots of peaks. Resolution is lower. This is liquid chromatography. Um, this is from a can coating, and um, this is the only substance which has been properly evaluated. All the others, some 
have been identified as reaction products. For the most, we have no idea what it is. And if I go back to the same what is relevant, then this peak here is such that probably it will be about 50 ppb in the food, which is, I could make a similar calculation as before, about 50 times more than the TTC. So peaks which are 50 times smaller than this one should be controlled. Hmm. We have nothing of that. Paper and board, this is recycled paperboard, extracted, um, fractionated by HPLC into 1 to 7. These are the seven fractions by gas chromatography. You see lots of peaks. This is the saturated mineral oil, that's the aromatic, and then you have a rich uh, selection of more peaks. The chromatogram here shows small peaks. These peaks correspond to the size such that probably they will be about um, 10 ppb in the food. This is 0.1 milligram per kilogram in paperboard. Um, this is about 10 times above the threshold of potential uh, concern. So again, 10 times smaller peaks than these should be um, identified or in some way the substance the safety of the substance has, has to be insured. Uh, just to make a uh, comparison, this is recycled paperboard and this is fresh fibre paperboard. This is all from somehow uh, from the previous life of these fibres. The story which is a bit more complicated but uh, perhaps gives a bit a taste of what the difficulties are. Um, these are uh, on coatings for water installations, domestic water supply systems. If the tubing, metal tubing, um, corrodes before it starts leaking, um, an elegant way is to remove the um, corroded parts and to coat it with such um, the material. One of the materials we tested um, was based on batch and these um, phenyl, com phenyl comines. These react um, at relatively low temperature and that's why they are chosen. Of course the mixture is more complicated but these are the main components. Um, yeah, how to show safety, how to make sure that uh, the inhabitants of such a building are not slowly um, victims of uh, chronic intoxication. There are three points to look at. First is after curing, when the coating is finished, um, is there something remaining uh, that can migrate which could be toxic? The second, by aging, um, what is released uh, from the polymer? So the chemical degradation, for example, by attack with chlorine or whatever, um, it's well known that these uh, coatings age and they are changing. Then there are biofilms, there are microorganisms eating, but they don't eat it up completely. Um, they release, uh, well, what do they release? So the safety of all these three aspects should be demonstrated. We only looked at the first um, to see a bit how far um, can we do that and how difficult is it. As a rough indication, it is about one kilogram coating material per person in a building. A big building contains a lot, but also many people. So <coughs> roughly one kilogram. It would be probably more for <coughs> very rich people in a very big house, but uh, that's their fault to have a big house. Um, <coughs> one kilogram and um, we determined that in the coating we looked at very precisely nearly 10% remained below 1000 Dalton. So the curing is by far not um, complete. Now how do you proceed? You can do the analysis in water and then again you go back to the TTC and that means that um, the detection limit for this um, analysis would be 75 nanograms per litre of water. Um, we tried all sorts of methods of analysis. We synthesised components we thought that uh, they may be formed, reaction products of course, nearly all the, all, only reaction products. 
And um, well, it's difficult to detect these components because they degrade, they, they are not, uh, it's not feasible by GC. So we determined that um, to get to this, um, we would have to extract that from water and reconcentrate this extraction, uh, these extracts 30,000, 13,000 times. Um, every analyst knows this is by far not possible. Um, for the phenalkamines, it is about 70,000 because detection is less sensitive. So roughly speaking, um, analysis in water um, is away from the threshold of relevance by a factor of 100 or 1,000. Well, I'm not speaking about the complexity. Um, if you would do that in water, you would have lots of trouble with the components anyway in water. Another way would be um, to do the analysis in the extract of the material. Saying that um, all the material of low molecular mass could um, be transferred to the water over 10 years. Maybe that's a bit exaggerated, but 10 years is a long time, so it's a lot of time for uh, migration. We look at chron chronic toxicity, so it doesn't really matter whether it's um, leaching out relatively rapidly or over the full 10 years. Then we calculate it on the amount introduced. We assume that 1% of the water is really consumed. The rest goes through the toilet or whatever. Um, and in this way, um, we saw that it would be 250 microgram per day exposure of small molecular weight material. Now, <coughs> you would have to analyze that and again up to the threshold level which is uh, the same 0.15 microgram per day and that means that you would have to check for components which uh, represent 0.06 percent of this amount hmm. have you ever done that that's impossible i don't think there is a, a chromatographic um, techniques that would allow that so <coughs> This is far out of reach. You could also say, well, we avoid the analysis. We go directly to biotests. But you also know that it is not possible to detect such a small proportion um, in, in a total mixture, because uh, you would have to introduce far too much of this extract into the vial. So the conclusion where we are today is that um, Thousands of people are daily exposed to that. This is a, an experiment in a way. Um, new buildings are treated that way. But there is hardly any information about safety. We don't know what the, is the composition of what is migrating. And uh, worst of all, we not even know how to do that. We are, at least in our hands, we were about a factor of 100 to 1,000 away from the level which could have ensured safety. Yeah, that's a picture of the situation. The main problem is what I call the ORPIS. This is a, an abbreviation for oligomers, reaction products and impurities. I don't like the term NIAS. This is a silly excuse. Um, even if it's not intentional, um, it still needs to be safe. Um, sometimes people think that these impurities are, these are traces or whatever, but if you go into the analysis of a complete migrate, and I have shown a bit, then you see that for reactive systems like coatings, this is the large majority, nearly 100% is such ORP. For polyolefins, it is still in the order of um, clearly more than half. How to get that under control? Um, Europe made a big at, um, effort uh, in the 1970s and tried to get the control through the starting substances, listing authorized substances. And believing, at that time toxicology was a bit different, that um, limiting the total by the overall migration limit would be sufficient to cover all the rest. Well, soon afterwards, um, it was noted that this limit is far too high to exclude uh, the presence of something toxic. 
Then a complicated, no, a simple um, simulation was established to render um, the analysis easier. You have to think of the methods available at that time, which were very primitive. This was the concept then, and I think it is around 2005, perhaps a bit before, that people realized that this is not going to um, reach what is promised by legislation. The task cannot be fulfilled in this way. Um, very important was that around 2000 industry refused further collaboration. Um, DG Sanko invited all the associations and asked whether they would uh, accept a broadening of the scope of the plastic regulation or to do other specific regulation and they all refused. We do it ourselves. So this is more or less the situation today. Um, of course, uh, toxicology has developed and there are endpoints which are much more sensitive, which makes everything much more difficult also. Also, there are far too many materials and substances are used to get it under control, so essentially it is nearly impossible. Well, nearly 5,000, no, more than 5,000 substances are um, used for printing inks alone according to industry. Well, <coughs> perhaps the most important step now is that um, the compliance work has to be documented and there has to be um, a compliance declaration guaranteeing to the um, customer that uh, the safety has been demonstrated. And um, the problem is that basically that's not possible. Um, I don't think there are many food contact materials, perhaps there is not a, uh, not a single one for which compliance can really be um, declared. For all, there are such gaps as I have shown. So <coughs> the silly situation that is that somebody has to cheat. Either the declaration has no uh, reasonable um, support or there is a di disclaimer which cheats the uh, customer, um, says, well, I have done a lot, there is no, um, well, what is not in it, but um, finally it's you to have the uh, guarantee. This is a silly situation which I think we should really avoid. Um, lying, cheating is not the way to go. But at the moment everybody lives with this, um, there are artists creating very nice disclaimers, nobody would notice. Um, sometimes um, retailers or brand owners uh, are fed up and they want to have the paper signed, they write themselves. And uh, well, the supplier usually signs that, well knowing that uh, it's not really supported, but also the, the one who has written the text probably knows that this is uh, unrealistic. Enforcement also knows, of course we know, but um, what should we do? And I think the worst is that media learned that this is a wonderful subject to make a scandal, very easy. Um, everybody can make a bit of analysis and show that safety has not been shown. How do we get out of it? I don't know. Uh, but definitely <laughs> we should start a discussion which um, is much broader than it is today. Um, so I'm proposing something, not because I'm sure that this is the best, but just to make the discussion a bit lively. First of all, um, the, um, we have to be more flexible and more pragmatic because the situation is as it is. We do not fulfill the expectation of the uh, consumers. Um, well, the system which we have to think of has to make that the readily feasible compliance work is done as rapidly as possible. That must be done. Today, I think many would not even start because they say it's too complicated. Why should I dig and invest and then I get substances which <laughs> cause me trouble? Why should I work to get trouble? So I better leave it as it is. 
For more difficult work, we have to, uh, to um, admit that uh, studies are needed. We have to find solutions. And I think for some uh, things, we won't get to the, um, uh, to the safety, which is basically defined by IFSA in Europe. Um, so we have to tolerate um, some um, gaps for a long time. <laughs> so work plans, that's my proposal. Um, first step is we have to uh, get um, reality acceptable, or we have to accept that. This is not so easy. Um, we as an authority, we, we are paid to enforce what legislation um, promises, and we can't. Um, the brand owner or the retailer, um, he also has to accept that um, compliance declarations are incomplete, not really supported. So mm, we have to make it acceptable. How could we make it acceptable? Um, well, I think we could do that um, if we say that uh, this is a temporary problem. We haven't done it yet. And we have a work plan. We have a, um, ideas how we could uh, com well, go as far as reasonably feasible. So work plans to justify um, temporary acceptance of a situation which is not uh, corresponding to the legal requirements. OK, how to do that in more practice? First, I think these gaps what I call gaps, so what is not done, has to be described. Well, so the producers of the material, can be an association or so, they have to define what uh, are these gaps. Could be, well, oligomers or reaction products or something, and describe it, gap descriptions. Basically, at the end of the process, all these gaps should be uh, described by one of these descriptions. I imagine that these would be hundreds, perhaps also thousands of such um, gap descriptions. They have to be to some extent transparent. I think they should be registered somewhere. Um, well, don't know where. IFSA is usually the place to think of first. In the, it has to be publicly available in as far as um, what is the general subject matter and who is behind it, who is the owner of this description. I will show afterwards why this is necessary. Then uh, a work plan has to be elaborated. So what is the chemistry which has to be investigated? Um, how much could um, migrate? Um, how could we tackle uh, analytical problems? Also, um, what is the toxicological approach taken? I think for many things we need compromises because it's too complicated. Then we have to do some timelines to say up to when what has to be achieved. These work plans must be specific, realistic, not just clouds, that would be, yeah. Then these work plans have to be discussed. And um, there must be an authority with adequate competence to look at these work plans to, do, uh, to answer three questions. First, is the subject matter really such that it merits a work plan? Because if somebody just didn't do a very ordinary uh, compliance work, it's not acceptable to um, establish a work plan. So it has to be um, of a certain um, level. Then, is the work plan really the best choice? Um, the analytical approach, the toxicological pro approach, is the timeline acceptable? So, yeah. And the last question, is the safety assurance which is um, hoped for at the end of the process, is that satisfactory? If not, the material remains unacceptable and should be phased out. So it has to be discussed and sort of approved. And then, of course, you have to check whether the progress is as um, 
um, plant. The fifth step is now the paperwork um, the supply chain has to go through. If such a um, gap description is approved, um, yeah, then it can be used as a, as a part in a compliance declaration. But the compliance declaration means basically um, it is safe, has to be supported, and now either this is as today by concluded work, by data, by something, or it can be uh, supported by a gap description, so to um, fill the gaps which have not been uh, investigated to sufficient extent previously. So that's the new thing, to introduce that. Now, to get confidence, um, this has to be, um, well, controlled. And for this control, it must be possible to check um, the, com the um, work plan, or rather the gap description, um, through, well, for both. The supplier has to be um, checked. It must be that uh, the, um, the retailer at the end knows that uh, his supplier is part of the work plan, co-owner of the work plan. Um, also, authorities have to know that. And it has to be ensured that uh, the progress uh, is acceptable. OK. I wanted to, to make some sort of a picture of where we are. I think we are very far from where we should be. And we need something better to go on. Because the approach taken so far has not succeeded. Um, it's not a silly one, but it's insufficient. We need something more. And, um, well, I propose that for, I think, always um, an idea is the best as long as there is no better one. Um, we need to de-block the situation where everybody just uh, cheats, in a way. Um, we have to find a way to get the situation acceptable, temporarily acceptable. Um, the work plans are flexible. If we agree that uh, this is feasible, that is probably not feasible or not feasible yet, this is a possibility. And very important, it has to be feasible on the basis of the existing legislation. EU cannot change legislation and say, well, safety has to be ensured if that is easy or if it doesn't cost anything or it can't do that. Um, the sentence is there and has to be respected. So, Legislation has to be the existing one. So it is the enforcement authorities um, who have to insist on the work. And it is industry responding by what I call the work plans. And uh, we need risk assessment authorities capable of looking at these plans and uh, evaluating them. This just as a proposal. Thank you. <laughs>